Get up, get up, get up out of those seats. Get up off that couch. Let's give them some praise. Brian, be ready to come back out after service. We're going to go back into that after the word this morning. Oh, don't let me stop your praise. If you want to praise, praise them. Come on. church. Good morning at home, wherever you are tuning in this morning or at night, Sunday or Wednesday, whatever day it is you're tuning in. Welcome. My name is Pastor Marco. It is great to have you. And if this is your first time here, I want you to hit up the chat right now. Put up some hands. You know, say, I am here first time. And if there's anybody here for the first time, anybody, your first time here, raise your hand. We want to give you some love this morning. Good morning, good morning. Jenny, you got problems. But if it is your first time here, we would love to meet you, get to know you. If you're in the building right after service, we have our guest center. We would love to talk to you. We have a gift for you. And whether you're in the building or online, we want you to text the word guest to the number on the bottom of the screen. Right now, text that word, and we just want to just connect with you. We believe that church is so much more than a Sunday morning service. It's a home. It's a family. It's a place to belong. Whether it's your first time coming in and everybody are strangers or you just tripped on, you know... Facebook Live, whatever it is that you're watching this morning, it is a place for you to belong to. And we want to just give you that opportunity, and we would love to meet you. Amen? A couple of other things before I get into the Word, man. Are you all ready for an amazing spring here at Kingdom Life and summer? Man, God is doing some stuff. But let me just, let me just break down the next couple of weeks for you. Next Sunday... May 22nd is going to be a special, special Sunday. Some people know. Some of you know Terry Fonseca. Am I right? Some of you haven't had the honor and the privilege of getting to know her, meeting her, having her lay hands on you, praying with you, encouraging you. But our girl Terry Fonseca, she's been here for what, 28 years, Terry? 28 years she's been in this house serving, covering this home, running our intercessory prayers, you know, serving and, you know, on staff with Pastor Mike and the counseling and shepherding of people. I mean, just you name it, a heart for this house and for God and for prayer. But next Sunday, we are going to come up here and we are going to celebrate uh, together as a family as we license her as a minister. <laughs> at Kingdom Life. Long overdue. Woo! Yes! All right, that hasn't happened yet, people. Okay? Hasn't happened yet. Finish clapping next week. Also, the following week, on May 29th, We are going to celebrate our 31st anniversary, and we want to do that the best way we know how, which is coming together as family, as friends, and celebrating and having a good time together after church. We're going to take a part of the parking lot. Some of you might be parking on the street. Some of you might be carpooling. Some of you just so we have enough space because we're going to have bounce houses. They're going to even put me in a dunk tank. My mother-in-law got so excited. She doesn't like to spend that much money. I think she's going to like buy like 20 balls. Like, I'm dunking that too. So, but we're going to have a dunk tape. We have food trucks, games. We're just going to get together and celebrate, have a good time. 
get to know one another a little bit more, share stories of what God has done this year, last year, from 30 years ago, all the way up. So come on out on the 31st, invite friends, family, other people that are part of this church that you don't see every week. Make sure they are here. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. And then on June 5th, on June 5th, these are the next three weeks. I can't go any further. On June 5th, we're going to have Andrew Palau come and share with us that Sunday morning from Palau Ministries and the City Fest and his wife, Wendy, are going to be with us. He's going to share the word, talk about City Fest, talk about ministry, talk about just what God is doing and what God is going to do right here in our area in Bridgeport this summer as over 10,000, 20,000 people. We're believing and speaking it in. I think last time they were here, they had over 10,000 and we're believing for more down in Bridgeport, August 27th and 28th. For the festival, but we have more to say on that in the days and weeks to come. Are you ready to get into the word this morning? Open up to Galatians 6 and just hold your spot right there. I lastly want to thank from the last couple of weeks Pastor Dave for bringing the word about being still, being still. And allowing God to birth something in us. And then Minister Lauren coming last week on Mother's Day Sunday and talking about the process of actually carrying what God has conceived in us or getting God to conceive something and birthing it out in the stages. And I want to piggyback off of that this week. I was just struck by... The part where she was talking about, and I was there, but as she was trying to push out Luca, and if you weren't here last week, definitely listen to that message. As she was trying to push out Luca, who is our 12 week old, 12 weeks maybe? 12 week old son, right? That the support that she had from the doctors, the nurses, the doula, myself, and others. She didn't really save me last week, but I'm just throwing myself in there, okay? All right? Just throwing myself in there, okay? I was there for a reason. All right. So, but that support and that we're not alone. And God didn't design us to go it alone. And that's a lie of the enemy. See, we are living, and this isn't necessarily a new thing to today, but it is so heightened. But we are living in a culture where we want to be isolated. We are all about self and self-motivated for our, just our own interests. And then what's heightened with that is this thing of just canceling out people or things or movements or whatever it is in this cancel culture that just constantly tears the fallen even down even further. And is this really the heart of God? Is this how he wants us to interact with one another, of how he wants us to be with one another and how important it is? So... Let's just jump into Galatians, and then I'll have a lot to say about this scripture, which I'm sure I probably won't get past the two verses, but we're going to read from Galatians 6, 1 through 10. In the NIV, it says, Paul is writing here to the church, and he says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should carry all good things 
should share all good things with their instructor. Oh, that one will preach. I'm not preaching that this morning, but man, that scripture. Ooh, that's a good one right there. All right, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Can I get an amen to the word of the Lord? Man, there's a lot in there. So a couple months ago, Oscar night, the slap heard around the world. All of us here know, maybe there might be one or two of you, God bless you, but the the whole world knows about this slap. And I'm not here to give you commentary on the slap, on what happened, how it happened, what should happen to Will Smith afterwards, or all of those things. That is out of my control. I don't even allow my thought life to even go down that road. My thought and my question is, looking at how culture has responded to this man, and I'm not saying he's a victim either. He did something that was wrong. He could have actually had charges pressed against him. Okay? So... It was egregious, it was bad, it was, it was not good. But here's my thing. It happened and now his movie projects are getting canceled. He's not posting on social media. He, can't, he's all, he has to now be, you know, shunned and go into hiding. And you're not good enough to now, you know, work with people and people aren't going to even post images with you. You're like, how could I even reference a Will Smith movie knowing he did this from the pulpit, blah, blah, all this stuff. So culture has responded like culture responds, which is canceling him out. My question then is, when is it enough? When does he get to act again? When does he get to produce a movie again? When does he get to hang out with his family and friends and post it on social media and have the 432,000 likes that he had before? Will that ever happen again? I don't know. It's a, some arbitrary process of jumping through hoops to try to redeem ourselves and be good enough to the people around us that saw our fallen mistakes, our sin. The following week, not as popular, there was a comedian that won Best Comedy Album of the Year in the Grammys. This gentleman, a few years ago, actually you know, had a vile, disgusting act of sexual self-deprecation in front of women that came out that he ended up losing a TV show he was in and just, you talk about cancel, cancel. And then here we are a few years later, he comes out with a comedy album and he won the Grammys and everybody was in uproar like, man, this is how could this happen? And just social media was a buzz. I'm not adding commentary whether he should have won, whether it was time. But my question is, what is the process of restoration? What is the role of a Christian, of a believer? Because that is what we would say the world, entertainment, secular world, which just means outside of the church, outside of God. But inside the church, is it much different? Is it much different? Man, I wonder how many of us see churches or leaders 
throughout our country making mistakes, falling into sun, some very egregious. You know, watch the expose on Discovery like, oh my gosh, did you see that four-part expose? That was crazy. Can you believe they did it? I knew. I knew there was something wrong with that church. I just knew by the way they dressed. I just knew by the way they had all those fancy lights. I just knew because they were hanging out. Is that really our heart? Is that God's heart? Because we have to wonder, like, why do Christians, that, that, that term, you know that saying, we eat our own, we just devour our own, do we know how to protect, to build back up, to restore our fellow believer? Or do we just jump on the, you know, the culture and, or even the things within our church? Even if we brought it back home, if we heard about one of the pastors, what would be our response or one of our ministers? Like, oh, did you hear what Pastor Marco did? Oh, my gosh. I knew there was something wrong with him. Okay? I just... And we condemn. We cancel. But if we look at the Scripture... If we look at what the Bible says of what God's heart is, it's about one another. And more importantly, it's about restoring one another. I mean, listen to this again. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, just that, the way that is said is so intriguing to me. It's one thing when somebody comes to you or somebody comes to their pastor, somebody comes to their parent or their spouse or their best friend. It's like, man, I've been carrying this for so long. You know, I messed up and I, I've been doing, I need help. Will you help? No, no. This doesn't say somebody was convicted and repented and came to a leader or a parent or a pastor or a friend or a small group leader or whoever. To pray. It says if someone is caught in sin, you will live by the Spirit. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. Oh, I have so much to say about these few little scriptures. I'm just going to jump right into it with the few minutes I have with you. So a couple of thoughts. I believe there is a natural response to sin that we have in us. There is a natural response to whatever story we hear, whether it is a Will Smith, whether it is the pastor from the mega church from New York City, whether it is the person that you know I work with, whether it's my boss you know, my family member, whoever it may be, we have this natural response. Do you know what your natural response is? What is your natural response? Is it to gloat, to gossip? Is it to just be like, yeah, I feel better right now because now that mega church isn't that much better than ours. Being real. That's how people think. You're like, oh my gosh, how could a pastor think? Okay, let's think about you. That family, the Joneses, right next door to you. They got it all going on. And now they're getting a divorce. 
Oh, okay, yeah, all right. I'm doing better than the Joneses today. Hallelujah. Now you're like, oh, I can't even laugh to something like that. Because our thoughts, the things we think, some of us are good. We would never speak it. But how do we react in here? Because there is a natural response to sin. What is our normal response? Is it condemnation? Is it judgment? Or is it grace? Is it empathy? Is it compassion? God's response in the garden, Adam and Eve fall. His response is love. And that love was shown through grace, through empathy, through compassion. Now, just like Paul says a little further on, there are consequences to our actions and to our sins. Don't get me wrong. We're not just bypassing all of that. God's, you have to, we reap what we sow. So, yes, sin has now come. Death is here. Let me bring you out of this garden and out of paradise. Because, But God's response was immediate a plan for restoration that he put forth. And not because Adam and Eve came to him and begged him for forgiveness. They actually hid and tried to hide and not say anything to God. Just like one of our little children. And that good, good father came and put forth a plan of Jesus immediately. But even more than that, he clothed them. And he didn't just clothe them. He had to sacrifice and kill an animal to properly cover them, to properly cover their shame. Why is this important? Because we're never going to try to ask or do of ourselves what God hasn't done before us. God is the greatest restorer. God sent his son to die for all of us so that all of us may be restored. And the Bible says over and over again that we have fallen. We need restoration or we needed restoration and we are restored through Christ Jesus. That we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How quickly we forget about that. Now I know I'm not talking to everybody. But man, there's a big part of culture, there's a big part of church that, man, we need to get our hands around this. Will we be somebody that responds with grace, responds with compassion and empathy? Because those things now determine what I do, what I say, what I will post or what I won't post. How I talk about somebody. See, for me, I am not perfect. Don't get me wrong. But when I hear of a pastor or a church or a priest falling into sin, man, I pray for restoration immediately. Immediately. I want them to be restored however God wants to restore them. They might never have the same position or the same ministry or the same thing that they had before. Or it might be a full restoration of that. The same way I might in my own marriage or you may in your own marriage or in your own parenting or your own friendships do something so bad, so egregious towards that that you lose that marriage. And now you're divorced. Does that mean that that now is your new identity for the rest of your life? Or is it that God wants to restore you? And it might be in a new and different way. Or it might be going back and restoring that very marriage that you lost in the beginning. God is a God of restoration. And he's calling us to be a people of restoration. So now the word implies... It says, if we live by the Spirit. (laughs) Once again, I always look at these words, and 
So I, I, now, you may have never had this thought before, but as I read this, I'm like, why does it say those that are filled by the Spirit? Why does it say live? Is there a difference? Is it possible that we can be filled by the Holy Spirit and not live by the Holy Spirit? And we're happy to be filled, but never truly live. When God is calling us to live by the Spirit, not to just be filled. How do we live by the Spirit? By first being filled. That's like saying, I'm saved, so I'm mature in Christ. No, you are not mature in Christ. You are saved, you are redeemed, but now starts the walking out process. So for us, I think we need to realize it's not just about having a good church service or a good feeling or being filled and having this moment with God. It's what we do with it. Okay, and if we're not willing to live by the Spirit, and it says, right, right here, what does it say? It says, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. What I love is Paul talking to the church and saying, I remember, I was there. I laid hands. We had a Holy Ghost moment, moment, and moment while I was there with you for those months or weeks, however long he was at that church. And he's saying, you were filled, so you need to be living it. And if you're living it, this needs to be the reality. And what's the reality? What's the reality? What's the reality? That it's restoration. That it's all about restoration. And it's not just any old process. We get restoration twisted sometimes because we want to try to restore people and put the onus on them. Did God put the onus on Adam and Eve when he restored them? Did he have them do or react or even come to a certain place where he said, oh, now I will cover your shame. Or now I will protect your children and your children's and your children's children for generations to come as I bring and forth the plan of salvation through Christ Jesus that will restore all mankind, including you and everybody, all the way to the end, back to this very place, this garden. No. No. See, we have a ministry of reconciliation. We have a job. And I say that word job loosely. We have the DNA of God, which is grace, which is love, which is mercy, which is restoration. All of us have been restored. There's no way to salvation without restoration. And now we have this opportunity to walk out this ministry of restoration for all those around us. But we try to put the onus on them. Oh, yes, I tried to restore that brother. I really did. I told them what he needed to do, and he didn't do it, so I'm done with him. You know, it's true. We might not say it like that, but we have other ways we say it. We justify it. Rightly so at times. But the word implies that my response to my brother and sister that has fallen in sin is to restore them. And this type of restoration is gentleness, which is a fruit of the Spirit, which we should have in us. So if we don't know how to be gentle with the people around us, then we need to live in the spirit and mature a little bit more. But here's my point with this gentleness. Gentleness implies that it's not a cookie cutter process. It's not I'm going to restore you the way I restore you the way I restore you because here are the four-step process of restoration. Gentleness. 
I have two children. I have a two and a half year old that is strong, thick, big. I take him and I throw him in the air and he falls onto the bed. You know, it's, I, he'll stand up, I'll push him down and he falls and he laughs. Sometimes he might cry and that's when his mom will say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> but then I have a 12-week-old. Guess what I can't do? Put him on the bed. Oh, okay. Put him on the bed. All right. Oh, let me get that neck. Oh, okay. That's all right. There it is. Wait a second. There. Yeah. All right. There it is. There it is. He's not crying, babe. I did it. Roman, he's right over there. He doesn't know gentleness, especially with his little brother. He doesn't know that. He just come over there. Uh, 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 uh. Even when he is gentle and he comes over, he's like, oh, baby, baby. Oh, yes, I love you. And then while he's walking away, just, uh. And then we're, ah, we're like, dude, what's up with that? What's going on? What am I trying to say? Depending who I'm talking with, who we're restoring, gentleness looks different. Gentleness looks different. Regardless of how it should be, who is this person? Where are they at? That's why we have to listen. We can't restore without listening without caring, without having empathy, which means to literally listen, to hear where they're at, to hear how they've gone to a place instead of coming to immediate judgment and then bullet points. It means me asking more questions than just spitting out the answers. Man, I got like seven more points here. All right, I'm going to go really quickly here. All right. So now, this gentleness needs to be how we engage with one another. How we look at the Will Smiths and the pastors of the world or the celebrities or the social media sensations of the world that, you know, fall one day and rise another or our very friends and family and having this gentleness to realize it is my responsibility. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to talk about another part of this which is a two-way thing and there is part of me, the one that has fallen, that has stumbled into sin that I still have to do. It's not, you know, oh, it's just all now on us and people can just do what they want. That is not the heart of God and what he's saying. So the next thing that is so key in the scripture is where it says we need to be careful. And this goes into gentleness. This goes into our ability to minister, to engage, and to try to restore. There's going to be situations, people, things that are way above our head. Okay? Plain and simple. We need to be self-aware. We need to be aware enough to realize, listen, I just got over, you know, smoking and drinking and partying. Yeah, I'm not going to go and be able to restore this person that smoked because I could easily just trip into that. I'm still being restored in that area myself. Or I just don't know much about this area. There's talking about, 
all this stuff, and then we just give our judgment answers, and we've never done the work, the research. We don't have any experience. We don't know the depth of God's word when it comes to depression or fear or judgment and all these things, and we just give these, you know, whereas me as a pastor, I can talk to somebody, and they might say something, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to pray for you and believe you're going to be restored, but I want to introduce you to Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, I think, can speak directly to where you're at, and he has that experience to do that because I can't, and I don't want to just fall because falling into temptation isn't just falling into the egregious sin that they're in. That might not be the temptation you fall into. You might fall into the temptation of judgment. You might fall into the temptation of condemnation. You might fall into the temptation of actually giving up on that person, which isn't the heart of God because the enemy's going to be like, this dude isn't worth it. Marco, this dude isn't worth it. Pastor Dave comes in and is so effective. He never even has that thought come up because he's been there, does that, has such a grace to deal with that situation and is now restoring. That's why restoration is a church-wide thing. It's not an individual thing. But let me continue here. How do we restore? It says we carry each other's burdens. And this goes to this thought of one another, this shared life. So let me just share a couple of scriptures with you. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of of it. My role in restoration can be to mourn with the person that's mourning, can be to pray with the person as the pastor or the counselor or the professional or the spouse, whoever it is, is doing the hard work. My role is not to sit up here and condemn, not to sit up here and judge, but to sit and pray and believe Romans 15, verse 1 and 2 says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and, do, and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. What? The new life into which we have been born through Christ is a shared life. God is asking us to come in together. The word that is used where it talks about restoring the burden in the Greek is koinonia. This word koinonia is a Greek term that encapsulates a shared life. We see it a lot when it talks about fellowship, but fellowship is such a watered down term that we use like, hey, we're going to fellowship after church in the foyer. We're going to talk to each other and say hi. Oh, we have a moment of fellowship during the service. Oh, we're going to fellowship next week. No, no. Fellowship was actually shared life together. It means, look at this, an intimate spiritual communion and participative sharing in a common religious commitment and a spiritual community. It is actually sharing one another. This term, one another, kononia, is found in all these different places. Let me just break down some of them of what one another really looks like. Devoted to one another, Romans 12.10. Honor one another, Romans 
Live in harmony with one another. Romans 12, 16, 1 Peter 3, 8. Accept one another. Romans 15, 7. Serve one another in love. Galatians 5, 13. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 4, 32. Admonish one another. Colossians 3, 16. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Spur on one another toward love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, 14. Offer hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 4, 9. And love one another. 1 John 4, 7. These are all what it means to now to restore one another of us actually sharing and carrying and being there with our brothers. Now, in verse 5, there's this, Paul says, for each one should carry their own load. Is he contradicting himself? Especially because in the Greek, it's the same word, burden. Is he, he's not contradicting himself because what we need to carry is self-examination. What we need to carry the load is Self-correction. Because I can self-correct and self-examine all day long, but if you do not choose to restore me, then my self-correction is lost. It doesn't matter. Right now, a pastor that we heard in a tabloid that fell or that celebrity that fell or that friend or that person in the church on social media, whatever it is that fell into sin, that's the last thing we hear. Two and a half years later, what did they do for two and a half years? But we treat, we don't know any of that. And we just treat them by what the last thing we heard and saw. And that's the standard we live and we keep them to. And that's not right. But it's this both. I need to now have this self-examination, self-correction, which now comes to the Lord, which asks for forgiveness, which now tries to set things in, in place in my life, getting counsel, getting leading, getting mentor, you know, being underneath covering, all of these things. But then for us, it's the restoration to say, no, you belong. No, this is still home. You're still family. No, I still love you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to spur you on. I might even give you opportunity. But whatever it is, there's this balance now to restoring one another. And it's something we need to be actively a part of. Worship team, come on up. Like I said, I want to go back into that song But I want to finish with this final thought as they come up. What is the law of Christ? Because it says when we carry people's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. So one is there's deep significance and meaning for us Investing in one another and caring for one another and being gracious and providing care for one another. And it is us fulfilling the very law that Christ gave us. What is the law of Christ that we just fulfilled? Mark 12, 29 says, Jesus answered and said this, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbors as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Jesus is saying, the law that I want you to live by is to love God with everything you are and then to love people 
in the same way. Love God, love people. Every time we tear somebody down, every time we judge them, every time we believe they're canceled, every time we put condemnation on them, we're not loving. We're not, thus, we're not living by the Spirit. Thus, we're not fulfilling the very calling that God put on our lives. The very law of Jesus, which is to love him, to love one another. Because if we truly love him, we will never forget who we once were. Regardless if we were the younger son that had the worldly egregious sins that got lost out in the world or what I call even the more destructive sins, which is pride, vanity, lust, judgment, condemnation, all of these things which gets us, and the why is it because it gets us to step into the throne of God and say, no, no, God, I can do this better. I know what they need more than better than you do. And I'm going to keep this judgment on them, not realizing, man, God's judgment all along for us is mercy and grace, and we receive it every single day. And if we realize that and we receive that, we're going to give it away. Worship team, come on up. Stand on up with me. There's so much more to say in this. There's so many nuances and balancings, things to some of the statements that I made. And maybe I'll bring that in next week. But hopefully you dig into this scripture. You dig into this area because God is calling you to be there for one another, to restore one another. So let's pray and then we're going to get into some worship for a couple minutes here before we leave. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Jesus, that you first restored us, that you covered our shame, that you got rid of, made us white as snow, that you washed our sins, that you made us new creation in you, and now you call us to be part of this ministry of restoration towards one another. So, Lord God, help us to continue to grow and love you and to continue to grow and love one another and not just speak it out, but to act it out. In Jesus' precious name, let's worship. You want worship? Let's go. Let's get that song we did right before. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Clap our hands. Wandering through the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. The bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. Just when I ran I rode, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I am not alone, because he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground, I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart. But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burning in bitterness You could just keep it moving Nah, you ain't welcome here From now to now I walk the streets of gold
KLCC.us forward slash give. Thank you for your generosity. Also, we would love to connect with you. So please follow, like, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms, as well as downloading our app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. Be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a thing. Thanks for watching and see you next time.